did a, we did a panel. Mm. Did you have fun? I did. It was great. Yeah. I don't do a lot of panels, but I was happy to be part of this one. And you drove straight from work. And you had to do a recall. Yeah. Yeah. Early this morning of a mix I delivered at about 1.30 this morning. Woke up to some notes and realized uh, I needed to be leaving for the NAMM show. And uh, so I did both. And <laughs> for those of you that don't know, because I didn't introduce you, this is my Mike Pierce Santa. So we were just talking about like records, record making process. Yes. How I, as a, when I play bass, yes. I never would ever question the drummer. I'd always question myself when I came back to playback. Because mm. you were talking about listening to some tracks from Who's Next and yes. Sunset Sound. Yeah. Because we were reminiscing about Sunset. Yeah. Good old alumni of Sunset. Yeah. What a studio. Oh, yeah. the best. And how, like, if you solo any moment of Keith Moon, you're like, this is chaotic. Uh, but you put well, the whole thing together. And it's not his performance per se, but just the individual tracks you pull up. Uh, with modern recording yeah, techniques, uh, I guess you're just astonished by what you hear bleeding into the drum mics. Yeah. Uh, however, when you put it all together, it all goes together in an amazing way and sounds like the Who. But they would have done the same thing. They would have been playing, then it would have come in the control room. And if yeah. the bass was too loud, they probably would have turned it down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is true. It's, it's, it's a part of the art that's lost. Not entirely, of course. You mm. make records that are still performance-based records. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in rock and roll, it's definitely... Yeah. But even dead, in my but... world, there's um, a certain amount of control that you're capable of these days that I think can uh, lead down a dangerous path. <laughs> and right. lead to too many uh, choices, let's right. say. Um, I'm one who loves to make choices early and often and move in a certain direction, but it's not always my decision right. to do that. And so often I go to a mix and I'm left with eight guitar tracks that play from top to bottom of a song, and uh, just pick what you like. And uh, now we've got hours of sifting and sorting, sure. and by the time you do that, you're almost questioning uh, your sensibilities at some point because you're uh, stagnated by the process of it, you know. Right. So. Are you tracking the tape? Um, often. Often, yeah. Not always, but often. Right. Yeah. And that in itself is a performance medium, so. Yeah, it is, yeah. Um, however, you know, we've sort of tried to eliminate some of the limitations of tape. Uh, uh, I guess, uh, put it this way, um, Back in the day before Pro Tools or uh, all the other great workstations, uh, you had to make a choice. The guitar player said, I want to redo that solo. And you said, OK. And the one you just did is gone then. You understand that. And they're like, yeah, let's do it. And you punch in and you go for it. Uh, but when we track to tape now, what I do is I feed the output of the tape machine into Pro Tools uh, live, so it's on input. So I'm getting the same signal there, monitoring it back through Pro Tools. And then as the band comes in the room to listen, I will actually lock the machines together and be transferring off the repro head Nice in there. And so I have a live take of all the you know, warm ups and everything, mistakes. And then I have what went to tape and uh, put that in there. And if someone wants to go over a track, I already have it in there in two places. And uh, also, if the tape runs out, which I've had happen before, uh, you get a band out there and they play more than 16 and a half minutes, yep. your tape starts uh, and you're like, but I've got a live feed going to Pro Tools that I catch the end of it and it's fine. Do you find yourself dumping back onto tape in that situation? Um, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I will. Um, although there was an instance uh, on a record I did for T-Bone, uh, we had a crazy band, three drummers, live, <laughs> right? Uh, bass player. Who was this? Uh, well, we had Jim Keltner, oh. Jay Bellarose, Carl Azar, uh, Dennis Crouch playing upright, uh, Mark Rebo playing guitar, T-Bone playing guitar and singing. Yeah. And if I'm forgetting about someone, I'm so sorry. But uh, anyway, killer hot band. This is live in the studio. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just three drummers is enough to wrangle. But but then we're going to tape. So I have to fit all these things onto a reel of tape. And I'm realizing these are the kind of guys that are going to improvise, like a Miles Davis record or something. So I actually had two tape machines going that had the same input feed. And um, 
I could overlap the tape. So when one reel was about to finish, I would just uh, simply start up the other machine, and when that spun off, all done. Wow. They were both getting the same time code. So when I load them in, they would just automatically line up to what I transferred, and I just make a crossfade, and uh, boom, all the tape in there. So That's amazing. Fun stuff. Yeah. Well, I guess Not about for the uh, the meek, you know. I love the way Mark plays guitar. That's the way I want oh, to play guitar. Uh, amazing. Yeah. Because it just seems so instinctive. His style-wise, I mean, he can go any direction, but what? Um, I'm blanking. You're going to help me out. What's hmm. the name of the? Um, she's a jazz artist piano player mm. she was on like jimmy kimmel you guys have done an album with her and i'm blanking on her name oh boy you're putting and, me on the spot here and, and so so this is yeah it's, she's a canadian jazz singer and she's playing piano brandy and, carlisle no it wasn't brandy but brandy's amazing yeah yep and i wouldn't call her a piano player yeah but but it comes amazing singer it comes in and he takes a solo on it i think it was a jazz master maybe it was a jaguar and mm. he's sitting on he's sitting oh, on diana a chair Krall. diana Krall. yeah yeah, well, yeah. Blanking. So obvious, yeah. sorry. So yeah. everybody, at the moment, there's a hundred <laughs> comments going, Warren, you didn't know it was Diana Krall. And you know what? He, I didn't know it was Diana Krall. Yeah, I know. I didn't explain it very well. And he takes a solo and he's mm. sitting on a chair and yeah. he's like, in the chair like oh, this. Yeah. Oh, man. And no. it's the best freaking, oh. My first, so instinctive is the way his phrasing is just like. Unbelievable. I like <clears throat> him and Jeff Becker, like the, the way they play, they're very mm. different players. Yeah. But they yeah. both come from the same school yeah. where you just feel like, it's oh. about the emotion. They're not playing no, no, a no. riff. It's There's coming no up riffs. through them, yeah. and uh, they're they're not thinking. It's yeah. it's it's a trance. Total but instinct. I yeah. just want to say along those lines, my first memory of Mark Reba. I've never met him before. Yeah. Uh, he comes straight from the airport in a rumpled suit, dragging <laughs> a suitcase that I figured all of his clothes were in, <laughs> and he unzips it and dumps it on the floor, and it's just a mess of cables and pedals and. <laughs> and he spent 20 minutes putting everything together and we're finally <laughs> gonna record him and uh, he went crazy. He was in some trance somewhere and he was picking up his keys and running them up and down the neck and he had a balloon and uh, like, I'm like, wow, I've never seen anything like this guy. All and, you're doing uh, is making me like him more. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. But it was just like, boom, like I got to work with this yeah. guy again. He's unbelievable. And yeah. I apologize for so not fun. knowing Diana Kroll. You can all We know him. Diana Kroll. You guys yeah, can yeah. edit that part yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> that was a crazy We, we knew that. <laughs> yeah. They'll just back time it and insert nah, it. Nah, in I'm just another dude. You know, I can't, uh, remember. I can't remember my own name sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but fun stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, thank you ever anyway, so much. I got a million stories for some other time. Yeah, we'll get them. We'll, we'll get the we'll million stories. It. We'll definitely do it. Thank you. All right, sounds good. Great. How are you, Wayne? You're doing marvelously well. Terrific. Nothing to complain about. Is this your first and only day at NAM, or have you been here for more? Um, I've been here probably for 20 years. Oh, right. <laughs> you haven't left. <laughs> <laughs> yes. This is this is like a, a, um, Hades for musicians. You it know, is. you're doomed for all of eternity to walk around NAM. Yeah. So what have you what have you been working on? Well. You know, most of my work is film and television. Great. And I'm just starting a new movie and just finished a memoir and raising my kid, and, you know, Great. trying to trying to put one foot in front of the other and not yeah. trip over them. Fantastic. <laughs> it was really wonderful. I, I had a wonderful evening with you tracking some guitar. And you played bass on that song as well, you remember? I did. I, I have a fondness for the bass. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Amazing work. Thank and you. signed my son's guitar. Yes, your son is terrific. How is he? Yeah, he's doing really marvelously Good. well. Yeah, he's yeah. really cool. I have a little boy too. How we is talked it? to. He's five now. Five. Yeah. yeah. We've got a little girl that's three and an eleven-year-old boy. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think. That's What's my his wife name? Over there. His name's Charlie. Charles. Charlie. 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 Yeah. Mom. Mom. Yeah. Well, is there anything here you've seen that you love? Anything particular? Yeah. You know, it's all a little overwhelming. You know, I, I I have friends here that I have professional relationships with, and I always like to check in with them and see how things are going. But you know, I think we're at a time where the, the technology and the tools are are so refined that re literally anything you want you can create. So yep. it's kind of like uh, artists market you know and yep. anything you want to do can be done now fantastic i agree well thank you ever so much for taking a minute to talk to us i really appreciate thank, it thanks for taking the time letting me thank blab you. i appreciate it thank you so i'm with my friend steve jackson how are you my friend oh, i'm wonderful good it's great to see you 
we have known each other quite a few years now. Yeah. And uh, yeah. probably like you may have only had one or two Poltex going in those days. Um, so I had just brought out a couple of new models and yeah. I brought them out to Boston for the Aerosmith sessions that you were tracking. That was seven um, years ago. I know. I, I can't believe it's been Wait. that long. So Seven we had just come ago. out with the 2520 version and yep. the MEQ5. Those were the, the two new products. Now, let's talk about the 500 series. Because okay. we were just talking about it. Mike Piacente is around here. You've seen him on camera earlier. Mike is like super humble, very smart, arguably one of the best engineers in the world. Just happened to have casually recorded like Alison Krauss and Robert Plant and won a few Grammys. My old brother were out there. I mean, he's he's T Bone's guy. He's right. Amazing. Right. And uh, but he's a geek like the rest of us. He loves gear. <laughs> he loves music. He loves musicians. We just spent five minutes on camera talking about uh, Thoreau, the guitar player. Like just you know just like uh -huh. oh. anyway. Back onto the subject. 500 series. I'm sitting in a room. You call over, and we start talking about it. And you're like, you know. What frequencies would you want to add? And I was like, I don't know, why don't we ask Jack? <laughs> That's right. And it all just like <clears throat> happened. So right. tell us about the Jack Douglas edition. The Jack Douglas Signature Edition MEQ 500. So um, I had wanted to do an MEQ 5, uh, a 500 series version of the MEQ 5. And like you said, you and I started discussing you know, some possible tweaks. Um, first thing Jack said when we brought him into the conversation was that he he had always wanted something between 1K and 1.5K, mm -hmm. and you know, 1.2K would be perfect. And so we said, okay, uh, we've got some extra switch positions. Let's let's add that. And then, as the conversation evolved a little more, we uh, we talked about having some overlap between uh, the lower boost band and the upper boost band. Um, and you know, as I think people probably know, the way an MEQ5 is set up. The boost is split, the frequencies are split from left to right, there are two switches, and then uh, the dip is all on one switch. And so we basically left the dip alone, um, but we, we were able to expand uh, both boosts uh, up to seven positions instead of five, so it allowed some overlap uh, between the lower and the upper, so there, you get 1.2 on the low, and then you also have 1.2 on the upper. We also expanded it up uh, to 8K, um, so it's it's getting into uh, the range of the EQP. Yeah. So um, makes it a lot more versatile. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Just adds adds a little more versatility. Now, exactly. as you were just talking about with Mike Piersante, it was definitely difficult to make it into a 500 series, but wasn't as difficult as one might imagine. So um, the MEQ was was more difficult than the oh, EQPs were. Oh, really? Um, there are a lot of components. Because ah. it has three separate LC bands, you've got three tapped inductors as opposed to one. Ah. And those take up a lot of real estate. And the EQP uh, 500s were already kind of filling the entire volume we had. Wow. And so, okay, um, well, I'm stand corrected on that one. <laughs> so, well, no, the, yeah, the EQP yeah. 500 was not so challenging. I mean, it, sure. uh, you know, there was a lot to cram into the can, and we weren't willing to make any compromises to the full-size solid-state unit. But the MEQ5 took it to another level, and uh, right. yeah, I, I don't think we could add another ounce of component to that. Um, well, this is fantastic. I'm very, very excited. Now, I don't have one yet to try, so I, no, I have to get um, one from you. Yes, we will have one to you uh, in, in early to mid-February. Wonderful. And uh, um, promise to Jack as well, obviously. You guys Absolutely. get the first first few that and come out. When you out. first called me about it and we were talking about it, I was like, well, I, I've always used Poltex like everybody else my whole life, but right. when I started working with Jack, my use of Poltex went through the roof. <laughs> so I was like, there's one guy that's going to know what to do, it's going to be Jack. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Him and Jay Messina, and I just think of that, yeah. Yeah. And those are the guys. Yep. So Wonderful. Well, thanks ever so much for showing it. Thank you. I'm excited to try it. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks, Warren. Mr. Gavin Lewison, how are you? Warren Hewitt. You having fun? I'm good, I'm good. Yeah, good. Um, have you had a chance to sort of look around and anything catch your fancy at NAM here? Um, more of like a global holistic thing. You know, yep. when I started out and when you started out, we were roughly the same age. Maybe I'm a little younger. No, I think you're, <laughs> hey. I think you're a little younger, actually. Um, you know, you really had to apprentice. You're 74 as well? <laughs> a little under 70. But, 
coming up close. You know, we, we had to we had to apprentice. We had to have a mentor. We we really had to get into it, and um, it was very limiting for a lot of people to make music. And if you wander this floor and you look at all this product, it's really remarkable how affordably anybody can get into expressing themselves through art. Art's an expression of culture, and now even in a simple operating system, you can start out making music. So all of these tools, which is which are very carefully thought out by all of these manufacturers, I mean, they're all really putting their heart into this stuff um, to make it easy for people to express themselves. And that's the thing that makes the biggest impression on me because I'm always thinking of those days when I started out, you know? That's amazing. I agree. I mean, you can't walk more than a couple of feet without bumping into somebody who's inspiring. Yeah. I mean, we were at uh, Mac DSP, yeah. and I was doing a, uh, like a, a talk there. Colin was asking me some questions. And we look up, and there's, there's Ken Scott. Yeah. I got teary-eyed. I'm like, <laughs> that, guy, that guy produced an engineer to Hunky Dory, yeah, and so he's standing over there. And that's what it's like. And these people are so accessible. Mm -hmm. And they'll give you their cell phone number. You know, everybody's yeah. so happy to share. It's it's remarkable. Yesterday, um, I came down here. I didn't uh, get to walk the floor, but I was. Uh, I came in for dinner. And at the end of the show, there was this massive drum circle with hundreds and hundreds of people that I think Roland was sponsoring. And they had a leader, and everybody just jumped in. And I was looking at all the faces, young and old, every creed and color you know you can imagine and everybody was bonding over music and it was Wonderful. bringing us together so this is all the manufacturers that create the stuff that we can make music with and the spirit of these people these these luminaries are wandering around you know and it's uh it's, it's also it's, great that it's bigger than ever it's the biggest nam they've done they've got more rooms more floors. new building and, yeah. and i'm just so proud of my industry and my colleagues and 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 you know what we represent in these in these difficult times that we live in yeah. this this concept of music and the tools used to make it is really the the, the uniting factor that I'm feeling here. And there's great spirit everywhere. There's no, what a great message. There's no funkiness, you know, there's no aggressiveness. Everybody's very peaceful Eric. here. Eric flexing his muscles and yeah. showing us his hair. <laughs> right, They're well, produced thanks. like a pro crew. Thanks, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Warren. Frank, how are you? Good, how are you doing? I'm good, we just discovered earlier that we did actually work on one of the same projects. Oh, it yeah. It was the live and rare one. The, uh, the the last thing Corn ever did at Epic, I believe. Yes, uh, uh, the well, the Corn was it the Corn record? Yeah, it was a live and rare one. Do you remember it was like CBGB's live oh, stuff yeah. they oh, had done? Yes. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I do remember. It was that. only a couple of years ago. Yeah, it was longer than I like to think, but. Uh, uh, I loved working on uh, all of their all of their albums. I mean, all the albums we did together. Really creative group of guys. And, uh, um, and uh, but I do remember we did something at CBGBs, and uh, it was uh, a five-one or something, but it didn't come out well. I hope it wasn't my fault, but. Well, but, I mean, it's CBGB. It's just a yeah, club about eight yeah. foot by well, two. Well, that's it. I didn't get. I didn't do the recording, but I, I, I tried mixing in five one and stuff. And I, you know, it's it had the energy and stuff, but doing the records with them was really a treat. Amazing. So, what I wanted to talk to you about was like I love your thoughts on creativity because I find that I open up YouTube and most and any online resources, and all they do is talk about. Take the kick drum, boost 60 hertz, pull out 250 to 350, yeah. boost 25 and 7. You know, and that's great. But I, that's like the beginning of what we do. And it, you were talking about going beyond that. Well, in, in fact, what it is is that's kind of the easiest part of what yeah. we do. The harder part uh, of what we do is getting an artist who's feeling insecure and how do you bolster their confidence. Um, a songwriter who suddenly hits a writer's block, how do you get them out of that? What is it that you do to challenge them to kind of think outside their normal comfort zone and, and move them into something that again, you know, energizes their creativity. So uh, there's all kinds of issues like that that a producer and even an engineer many times has to deal with on, a, on not only a daily basis but an hourly basis. Some artists are temperamental, some aren't, you know, it's a, it's a, but the whole thing at the end of the day is to try to get the best out of them you can. And I feel I've done a successful job, not necessarily when it sold a million copies, but if the artist comes out of it saying, 
wow, we really knocked that one out of the park. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Now you're doing a master class at Capital. Can you tell us a bit about that? I'm doing a master class with my uh, buddies in a group called the Metal Alliance. We're doing that March 11th and 12th. We booked out uh, three rooms at Capital Studios. Amazing. Um, Al Schmidt will be tracking in one room. Elliot Shiner will be mixing in 5.1 in one room. Um, I'm going to be working with George Massenberg. Uh, we go through uh, the ways and uh, all the ins and outs of mixing in the box. Um, and Chuck Ainley uh, will be working, uh, and Ed Cherney will also be doing some tracking. So That's amazing. we're all there. We usually get about 40 students or 40 persons, say uh, attendees, and we break them into four groups, and they get to see each of us working for uh, for a three-hour session. So that's amazing. We'll put a link down here, everybody, where you can find out more about it. Yeah, sounds very exciting. We just did one right uh, the the weekend after AES this year, uh, and it was it was a joy. We had it energized us so much that we're doing it again here in LA. So we did that one in New York at Berkeley Power Station. Well, I'd love to come down and do do a little filming there and talk about it. We'd love to have you there. That'd be amazing. I mean, we seem to be kindred spirits in a way. So I'm I'm. I like the kindred spirits. I mean, to be compared with you in any way, shape, or form is very humbling. No, no, it's. Uh, uh, I like to think that those of us that are passionate about what we do, that's you know that's what separates us from everybody else. It's almost if I can't do a good job, I knock myself. I, you know, I I just go crazy because, you know, but. So my whole idea is I want to put everything I have into the project I'm working on. Um, it probably makes for a shorter lifespan, <laughs> but uh, but uh, it's I really enjoy it. And now hopefully we can start teaching some of this stuff to the new generation because as you know we don't have that apprentice system. You know the apprenticeship sure. system that used to exist in the studio. Yep. Now okay. you're kind of. Uh, you may go, even if you go to a music school, you're kind of thrown out to the wolves after the end of the, the end of the day. So hopefully we can impart some of that. And you know, we lost Phil Ramone I know. a few it's years terrible. ago. And it's sad to think that that storehouse of knowledge and talent is gone now. So hopefully we can try to uh, uh, get that, you know, some of these other guys like Al and, and uh, George and so forth and get some of their stuff out there. I, I have a quick, quick little anecdote. I was in mixing with Al about went right at the very end, probably just a couple of weeks before Phil died. And he was working in the next room. Phil. Yep. He was working right up until the end. Oh well, no, yeah. I, and it was Jack and I, Jack Douglas and myself, and Stephen Tyler sitting in a room with Al Schmidt. And Al goes, "Oh, Phil's in the next room." And Jack and Phil obviously knew each other from years ago. So we snuck in like little kids into this session where they're recording a real orchestra, like a huge orchestra. The reason why I say real, you understand what I mean? We walk in and Phil is the chart like this. He's holding the chart like this with the arranger pointing at the chart, making adjustments with a pencil. Yeah. And Jack Douglas, of all people, and I look to each other and we go, that's a real producer. <laughs> No. Like we were totally humble. We're, we're just a couple of rock guys, you know, and there's a, a guy of, writing. Well, you know, and a lot of people don't realize that Phil Ramone was a childhood violin prodigy. Um, I've read his autobiography. Yeah, one and of my so he, uh, you know, as he's uh, he's one of those that started as a toddler, and and like you said, right up, literally right till the end, he was working. Yeah. That was his life, you know, that really was. Yeah, there's a couple of guys like that, like Bowie, the day before going That's to the right. premiere right. of his musical and then yeah. died the next day. Yeah, I, no, artist. I haven't seen that, but I gotta imagine it's gonna be, you know, terrific. So well, thank you ever so much for taking the time thank to talk to us. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Great. And we you and I have to we will. We'll let's do communicate. more. Communicate, and we'll be back in. Uh, we'll be here in March. Yeah. So let's let's see if we can put you know great. Put something together. Perfect. <laughs> Lovely. Hello. <laughs> How are you, Paul? You doing good? I'm doing good. Are you having a blast? I am. It's, it's less, a fun it, one. It's less germy in here. 
I, 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 at first when I arrived on the first day, I was like, oh, this is so annoying. I don't know where anybody is anymore. And now three days in, I'm like it because there's so much more space. The space is not as loud. It's not as brash loud, you know? Yeah. I mean, people get loud for a few minutes, but yeah. it's, it's nice. Yeah. And then I can't believe how tall the ceilings are. And then there's the floor above it. Yeah, there's a floor above it. Yeah. I would have put in three or four floors, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, who am I, you know? No, I mean, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's bigger and it's better. Yeah. And there's more people here. And it's kind of heartwarming, isn't it, the thing that our industry yes. actually is like, oh, wait there, there's more people and yeah, stuff I mean, is happening. You're still getting screwed, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's nicer. <laughs> In a much more polite way. Yes, exactly. So tell me, because tell me about this. Well, tell me about what everything you're doing. Right, hey, well, how the, about that? We'll start with the blender. All right, we'll it's start basically, with the blender. It's just a, if you look, you've got wet and dry in a level, wet, dry, level, wet, dry, yep. level, wet, dry, level. Yep. And you can put in your compressor or whatever and blend it with the dry signal. Beautiful. You can link it so you can do stereo. The left side controls both. And then you can also, it, with uh, the bus button, you got eight inputs that you can bus together and have right. it as an output. So guys right. that have like guitar rigs in the studio, they set it up with eight mics. They can just pick whatever mic they want and use it. Great, multi-purpose. Yeah. But the first thing you pointed to is great because I have a lot of old compressors, right. pre, you know, parallel kind of functions. Right. And now I can sit there, destroy it, and go. Right. That's nice. Yeah, I like that, that. That's what's so cool because a lot of those compressors really sounded great when they were just balls to the wall. Right. But they didn't sound great because they were balls to the wall. But yeah. the sound they had was cool. Amazing. So yeah. if you can blend that back, then all of a sudden you got, you know. And not everybody has enough faders on the right. console to bring up a bunch of parallels. Well, which brings us to the to the module. Okay. We got two models. We have a surround module and we have a stereo module. Right. So this is basically you got all your surround buses, or you got three stereo buses. Now oh, starting great. at the bottom, when you solo a channel, it turns blue. Now, if you've muted the channel and you solo it, it turns purple, so you know that it's muted. So you can set up your, if you do a breakdown and you hit the solo buttons, you can then mute things and then unmute it and then yep. unmute those. Right. So that's why it's set up like that. So, Perfect. And they blink, they're indicating the level. So when you spread your drums out, you can see uh, all your drums, okay? Nice. It's just, you know, it's all speed. It's like, to, you know, yeah, yeah. save time. That makes sense. Um, <clears throat> Then you've got a you've got a single knob equalizer. Yeah. We call it the TQ, and it's basically you know. Oh wow. Yeah. And then ab above that, you've got a high pass sweepable filter. Yeah. A low pass sweepable filter. Yeah. Then you have an insert. The insert also has a blend button on it. Dry, you can great. blend everything. Every everything you plug into the insert, you can blend every great. channel. Nice. Then you've got the input section. You have three inputs to the module. I, that's actually, I can't underestimate that. I wish that, that, that was a console function on my SSL, for instance. It would save me a lot of real estate, oh, walking yeah. about with floors around my studio. Oh, sure. Because I would just go, oh, I need a little less of that Poltec I just right. added. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the thing. So Because you walk away from the listening position over here to adjust something, come running back and go, yeah. That's Listen, a, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah so that's, that, that that's, helps out a lot. That's a really good idea, yeah. So input, you have three inputs, and they can all be used simultaneously. Yeah. So you can set them all up. So you can sum into the module if you want. You can combine three mics in here or whatever. And then you have right. a trim control. Then above that, you've got two mono cues, mm -hmm. and you got a stereo cue that goes to three stereo buses. The stereo cue also has an external input. Right. Now, if there's nothing assigned here, and you run something into the external input, you can actually blend that back with the channel. Wow. So if you have an effect on a guitar, you go out to an effect and you bring back in again, it's with the fader, right. and you mix it with this. Squared it. Now as soon as you hit that, it goes out to another bus. So this is like a separate mixer. So then that's that's the input module. Above that you have an optional bus section where it's eight buses. But I like this because now I can... Yeah, you can set up your cues. Yeah. You have a bus module up here yep. that's eight buses, and you have a pre and post switch on that. Right. And you have a pan and a level. So you can set this up as cues, or you can set it up as sends, or whatever. That's optional. Mm -hmm. When, you, when the, the master, we have a, a, a module that's a master, but you can use a mic pre. You can use a mic pre instead of this, so you can have flavors for all your buses as well. Right. Now the basic setup with this, with faders, eight inputs, and one empty 500 bucket, is $7,500. Oh, wow. 
So you have, then you can add it up. Every one of these buckets is adjustable angle-wise, so you set up the angles any way you want them. And then I make the side pieces for you when you buy your console. Like right. Terry Lewis and Jimmy Jam, they just bought a 16, uh, a 16, con 16 of a console. What we're gonna do with that is we're gonna actually rake the inputs up higher mm -hmm. and then have one section for mic breeze. Mm. Nice. So it'll be easier to see, you know. Like the, uh, I used to have a 71 API that was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the data mixes as and well. And because it's so, yeah. it's so narrow, yeah. you can put the speakers on either side yeah. of it so the height isn't as bad. Great. Now the other thing is, once you go beyond eight channels, because this runs independently, this will run by itself. If you want to go to 16 channels, you get two of these, and then you get the center section. The center section has the slate control, and it also has a screened-in area above it that has bus cards. And the bus cards, you can put in any op-amp that you want and any transformer that you want. So you can do 990s and nickel on stereo bus A. You could do 2520s and, and steel on stereo bus B. Stereo bus C, you could do tone lux. Right. So you'd have the three console flavors just on A, B, and C. Great. And then the master section, you have the same thing. You've got a blend on every stereo bus. Mm. And the master, right. the grand master. They all dump into a grand master. And then you also, these top three buses also dump into the grand master. So you can have six stereos feeding the grand master. So. Infinite possibilities, yes. I think, is what we're talking about here. And this, That's is, this is my little, my, this is my little inner, you know, my center section. <laughs> right. But you can, pro you can program the channels. If you look down there, you can yeah. sit there and you can turn off everything and you can program them from here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You've also got your solo functions. You've yeah. also got a fader to unity. So if I hit that, all the faders are now locked at unity. So you can sum. Right. And then you've got all mute and then all operate. Wow. Yeah, and that's all, that's all in this section right here. That's crazy. Well, fantastic. And there this you go. So wait there, once more, so this bucket is 7,500 loaded with two, is that what you're saying? No, eight. Eight? Eight faders, eight inputs, and an empty 500 bucket. Wow, that's good. You, you make the wood sides and you do all that stuff or I can do that, but that's basically that price. Where are you building this? Here. That's a really good price. Here in this room. <laughs> I yeah. built it yeah. here yeah. Wednesday night. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> No, that's good. I mean, that's yeah. really good. No, the so. the, all the steel and the painting. Yeah. I got a machine shop that's like a block away from my house. Great. The, you know, the boards and the knobs I have made in China. Yeah. Because that's where they make all the knobs now. Anyway, yeah. so these are a, it's a custom knob. Yeah. The switch caps are a custom switch cap. You know, nobody else has those. And then, uh, you know, the metal work I have done here, the boards I have done over there, because that's a company I've been using for like 18 years. Mm -hmm. and great quality, you know. Yeah. And. And I, then I have them assembled in Huntington Beach. Amazing. So there you go. Yeah, that's really good value for money. Fantastic. Well, thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you.